Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy. And so remove is another really important part of our policy. So you're not just putting the truth next to the lie. You're taking the lie down. That's a pretty aggressive approach. Is somebody trying to organize something like that, does that qualify as harmful information? We do classify that as harmful misinformation, and we take that down. I'm a very prominent and distinguished professor of medical microbiology in the University of Mainz, one of the main seats of learning in Germany, Professor Sutra Bharti, has made two major interventions in the politics of his country, saying that the shutdown of the economy is, is wrong and disastrous. Particularly, he argues that it's disastrous for the very large number of healthy old people in our societies who rely very much both on, on social contact and on exercise to sustain their health, and who, if this is prolonged, will, will be severely and permanently damaged, and he foresees uh, quite a, a large number of deaths resulting from this. When we hold life sacred and we hold our beloved fellow beings, our parents, our grandparents, people who are immunocompromised, I mean, these people are equally sacred and equally worthy of life as anybody else. And so that's a value that we should do whatever it takes to protect these people. Like my mother is in this category. If she got COVID-19, she would probably die. And I'm willing not to visit her for this month in order to keep her safe. But would I be willing to not visit her for six months or a year? And would I be willing to maybe never see her again? Would that be worth it? Would I be willing to tell the whole world to stop gathering just so that my mother can survive? No, I don't think so. It's a, always a trade-off of values. Like, what are we willing to sacrifice to keep these precious ones safe? Are we willing to practice social distancing forever if it reduces the death rate and makes average life expectancy six months higher? These people, you know, on average, who are, who've been dying of coronavirus, maybe they had an average of six months to live anyway, or who knows, you know? Is, is it worth totally changing the way that we live in order to postpone death a little bit? Sometimes it is. Like, there are times where I would be like, yeah, mom, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna visit you. Um, Cause it'll be over in a few weeks, and then I'll be able to visit you. Like, it's a worthwhile sacrifice. But we have to be clear that a lot of the rationale for social distancing, quarantines, and so forth, isn't going to go away. Maybe this virus will subside, but there's always the possibility of a mutant variation of it, or another one, or the, the flu, or, or there's always going to be a reason to maintain these practices. Or they say you can get reinfected with it, you know, maybe it's endemic. We're going to have it forever. So the questions that come up in the short term, it, are the sacrifices worth it? They're going to remain with us in the long term too, and it brings up what do we value? Do we value the prolonging of life at any cost? Or do we value play, the exploration of our boundaries, the challenging of limits, adventure? People make choices all the time that are risky, like to go to a festival. It's much safer to stay at home, uh, to let your kid play outside. It's much safer to keep them indoors, um, to, to go to a bar, to get on the highway. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of choices that we make in order to live life fully that put living life longer at risk. And I think that this conversation about our values is unavoidable. 
and hitting home for a lot of people. Um, like my friend, Lisa Rankin, who's an MD, she's saying, do you guys really know what it is like to be on a respirator? And she cites these statistics, like two thirds of the people who go on respirators for this die anyway. So instead of dying sooner, surrounded by loved ones, they're dying after several weeks of torture with a machine breathing them in an ICU behind glass, saying goodbye to their loved ones on FaceTime. But they get to live two or three weeks longer for a 30% chance of eventually coming out of that, but severely compromised. It's not like you're better cured. Is this conversation even being had? The medical system is geared around saving lives. It has no conception of dying well. Hospitals do not keep records of did the patient die well. It's only the fatality rate. This is just the tip of the iceberg of, of conversations that we need to start having right now. Restriction of political freedoms, uh, the censorship of information, uh, the destruction of small businesses, like all of these things, the, the, the increasing medicalization of life. Uh, all of these things were already happening. And now we get to ask, do we want them to continue to happening when we're being shown what they are like taken to the extreme? My hope is that we'll say, no, we don't want to sacrifice everything for the holy cause of risk minimization. Maybe we will accept a bit more risk, accept that death is part of life and no longer live in this regime of control that seeks to, to minimize risk, control every variable, guard against the world, guard against each other, and therefore not even really live in an, in an attempt to forestall death. Is that why we're here? Is that, is that the most beautiful world that we can imagine? Yeah, maybe according to everything measurable, we'll be fine. We'll have more gigabytes of downloads per person, more bandwidth per person, more life expectancy per person, higher GDP per, per capita. When we reduce life to quantity, then the qualitative gets left out. And this is another addiction when the qualitative is missing, like intimacy and beauty, then we need more and more stuff to compensate for it. Quantity says, how many years can I live? Beauty says, how can I live well? It provokes questions of why am I here to begin with? I'm not gonna survive life. I'm not going to have that on my gravestone. He made it till now. A brush with death can resurrect these lost truths. And I'm, I'm holding that out as a potential outcome of the coronavirus, that it is bringing death into our, you know, putting death in our faces and thereby resurrecting these questions of what is in fact a good life and why are we trying to preserve life at all costs rather than celebrate life and live life fully, live it beautifully, not just live it long. Why am I here? <laughs> am I here just to survive and reproduce and maximize my self-interest and go to the grave anyway? Or am I here to make something beautiful of my life so that instead of leaving no trace, I leave a positive trace on the world. And I'm part of this evolutionary project of life itself to create more and more life and a world that's more and more beautiful. That's the initiation. As an initiation into sovereignty, into kingship, queenship, the true sovereign is somebody who is in service and is consciously choosing that. In service to what? In service to the kingdom, in service to life. 
that is only possible when death shows us how precious life is because it ends therefore it's precious and our society doesn't get that we don't we don't embrace and accept death we think we can live forever we think that the highest goal is to preserve life preserve the self the separate self which is actually not permanent no matter what it's a huge delusion Am I here just to survive and reproduce and maximize my self-interest and go to the grave anyway? Or am I here to make something beautiful of my life so that instead of leaving no trace, I leave a positive trace on the world?